Hi everyone, this lecture is going to cover chapter 10 in our Fuller's textbook. Um, we're going to be talking about decontamination, sterilization, and disinfection in this lecture. Before we start, I would just like to um, suggest that you review the terminology at the beginning of the chapter. Most of those words we should be familiar with, but a couple of, the, of them might be new. Okay, so um, just as we discovered in our previous lecture about sterile technique and asepsis, there are a variety of organizations that um, determine the standards and the regulations associated with sterilization, decontamination, and disinfection. And some of those are listed here. It's a bit of an alphabet soup, but they are listed in your textbook for you. The first one is AMI, Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. So this is the organization that's going to provide the technical information for the U.S. medical profession, they develop standards, they work with the Federal um, Drug uh, Administration to develop those standards. The next one is the Association of Operating Room Nurses, and they also publish standards and guidelines specific to their organization and the perioperative care environment. The next one we should be very familiar with is the Association of Surgical Technology. If you haven't had a chance to look through the principles and practices um, on their website, I think it's a fantastic thing for us to familiarize ourselves with. The Center for Disease Control is in there again. It makes the list. Uh, the ECRI Institute, um, is involved in research and consulting, and they apply that research to determine which medical procedures, devices, drugs, and processes are best for patient care. TJC, this one's kind of gone through some revisions over time. This is the Joint Commission. We used to call them JCO in the day. Uh, the Joint Commission is the accrediting body for healthcare organizations. Now, do healthcare organizations have to be accredited? No, they don't. Uh, neither do surge tech programs. It's the same thing. Um, when a facility is accredited by the Joint Commission, that shows that they are operating at a certain level of standard. And then lastly, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and they um, set a variety of standards and regulations that have to do with devices, not just pharmaceuticals, um, but devices as well. Okay, so some of the terms that you might have seen at the beginning of the chapter I listed here. I just grabbed a few of them out. The first one being antiseptic, which is a chemical that's used to remove microorganisms from the tissue. Something that's bacteriostatic is going to be something that inhibits bacterial growth, but it doesn't destroy it. It keeps it from growing. Bactericidal means it does kill bacteria. If something is contaminated, that means that it has come into contact with some sort of microorganism. Cleaning just involves the removal of gross debris, like visual um, blood that you can see, tissue, body fluids, dirt, that kind of thing. Decontamination is the process by which instruments and supplies are cleaned and processed. Disinfection, on the other hand, removes most microorganisms, but not all of them. Uh, and then a disinfectant, of course, is that chemical that disinfects. Something that's an inanimate object means that it's something that's non-living. It could be a desk, it could be a blood pressure cuff, it could be a thermometer, anything like that. Reprocessing is uh, the act of rendering items safe for use uh, in subsequent cases. So this could be reprocessing of instrumentation or of equipment or um, even the turning over uh, of a room. 
so that it's ready for the next patient. And then lastly, sterilization. Sterilization is the complete destruction of all microorganisms on an object. So the book talks about something called the Spalding Classification System. And the Spalding Classification System is a way for us to categorize the, um, the risk associated with certain items. And so we look at three different categories, critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. And as we categorize these items, that helps us to determine do they need to be sterilized, disinfected, or just cleaned. So three different types of risk, high risk, intermediate risk, and uh, low level risk. So which items do you think would require sterilization? If you said critical items, then you would be absolutely right. Intermediate risk is going to be associated with semi-critical items, and a low risk is going to be associated with non-critical items. So what are some items that fit into those categories? Some examples of critical items would be anything that comes into contact with sterile body tissues. So any of our surgical instruments that we use. Intermediate risk uh, or semi-critical items are those that come into contact on non-intact skin or mucous membranes. So examples of those would be endotracheal tubes, rectal instruments, and vaginal instruments as well. And then lastly, non-critical items, which are those low-risk items, come into contact with intact skin only. That would be like our blood pressure cuff or our stethoscope. So let's take a look at the reprocessing cycle. The reprocessing cycle starts with us, the surgical technologist, and it starts uh, at what we call the point of use. So we are using the instruments during surgery, and during surgery, we're going to do some cleaning intraoperatively of our instruments. If an instrument comes back really bloody, or it has bone stuck in it, or it has tissue uh, stuck in the jaws, or something of that sort, we're going to clean it intraoperatively. Now, we really want to use sterile water to clean those instruments because uh, water with saline um, or saline has salt and it can pit the instrument. So we really want to use sterile water, but yes, sometimes we do just dip a sponge in the saline and go ahead and use that to wipe off our instruments. So it's going to start with us. Um, when we finish with a procedure, our next step is going to be to sort the instruments. Did we have a, um, a major tray and a a common bile duct exploration tray, and maybe we had a laparoscopy. Maybe we started with a, a, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy that went open and we had to do a common bile duct exploration. If that's the case, we have three different trays of instruments, and it's really nice for the, the individual that's going to be receiving and processing these instruments um, in the decontamination area of sterile processing that we separate those the best that we can. Now we don't want to mix the really dirty yucky ones with the quote unquote clean ones. Um, maybe we can lay a blue towel, uh, you know, put all of the clean ones back in the major tray, back in the CBDE tray, back in the lab coli tray, and then place a towel and put the dirty ones that belong in that uh, tray on top. So that way, when they get to processing, they're not all a big, jumbled, nasty, tangled mess, okay? So sometimes the facilities also will want you to, to spray the instruments with some enzymatic spray. So there may be a bottle in the room or nearby that they'll want you to spray the instruments down with because as instruments become dry and that blood and body fluids dries on the instruments, that is what increases the, the chance of a biofilm developing. So if we can keep, if we can moisten them and keep them that way, um, that's a good thing. That's helpful. Okay, so um, 
once we have done that, and, and we're going to disassemble everything and unlock any instruments that are hinge. Okay, we're going to send them to processing. Um, so uh, there's two sides to the to the sterile processing department or sterile processing department. There's the a dirty side, and then there's the clean side. So the dirty side um, has to do with where we bring the instruments after we use them, and this is where they get decontaminated. Okay, so decontamination means that we're going to make those instruments safe for handling uh, with the, the bare hands. Okay, so um, we're going to go into what different devices and processes are used in the decontamination process. But just for now, um, know that our job is going to take those instruments to the decontamination area for cleaning. Once they get into the decontamination area, they're going to be uh, uh, cleaned and then they're going to move to the clean side. And on the clean side, they're going to be um, sorted, they're going to be inspected, they're going to be assembled, packaged or wrapped, processed, and then stored. And then they wait on the shelf until we need them again. Where would we be in medicine without quality control monitoring? Uh, so this is definitely a thing when it comes to uh, sterilization. And uh, as far as quality control monitoring, some things that we look at is checking. Okay, so if it's the instruments, we're going to check them to make sure they're clean. We're going to look in the teeth and look in the jaws and look in the cannulas and look in the flutes, and we want to make sure that there's no gross things in there. Um, there's also going to be recording involved. As instruments and equipment are processed, they're going to be recorded in a log, and then there's also reporting that needs to happen. Um, other quality controls include the mechanical printouts on our, like our steam sterilizer or our um, gas plasma sterilizers and things like that. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think what it boils down to is just checking and rechecking and double checking. You know, better to have four eyes uh, checking than no eyes at all. Now, single-use items are items that are only used on one patient and then they're discarded. However, it has become a thing where if these single items are not used, that but they were opened, so they're no longer sterile, but there are some companies out there that will reprocess these single-use items for a lower cost. Um, however, the um, it has to be approved for reprocessing by the manufacturer. And if something does happen, like an injury occurs to the patient while they're using it, then the facility is liable for that. I, I do remember a time way back when when I was working at the Casa Grande Hospital and we were reprocessing all laparoscopic uh, devices that were single use, all the trocars, the scissors, the, um, the graspers, everything. We would put them into these big sharps containers that were a special color and um, they were sent back to the manufacturer, they were cleaned, they were um, spruced up uh, and they were sent back to us for a cheaper price. Um, things kept breaking, uh, things were malfunctioning, didn't really work well, we didn't do it for a long period of time. Loaner instruments are instruments that are not owned by the facility, okay? They may arrive um, via a vendor or a representative of the company, and they may be already sterilized. If they're already sterilized, they're going to be wrapped in these plastic dust covers and um, those will be taken off once they enter the facility, but before they enter the restricted area of the operating room. Some of these loaner instruments, they come a day or so before. Hospitals have 
um, policies about, you know, they need a 72 hour window to process any loaner instruments that are coming in for a case. These instruments will come in to the uh, sterile processing department, they will get checked in, logged, recorded, whatever the case may be, and then they will get processed for, you know, Dr. Smith's special case. And then uh, there will be a special area where the vendor can come pick them up afterwards, um, after they are cleaned. Um, so uh, that's kind of how loaner instruments work. Now, uh, I spoke about cleaning at the point of use. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what happens at the close of surgery. So as surgery is winding down, and let's say, let's set the scene, we've just passed the skin stitch to the surgeon. So the surgeon's closing the skin, and we're, you know, we're working efficiently. We want to make sure that by the time, um, you know, the surgeon's done closing the skin, that we have our area kind of tidied up. And as the patient goes out, we can go out with our instruments and transport them to, to the decontamination area. So at the close of surgery, there are some things that the, the surge tech's going to do. They're going to corral all of their sharps in the sharps box. So um, any hypodermic needles, sutures, blades, anything like that is going to be um, put in the sharps in the little sharps box that you have on your field. Instruments are going to be opened or unlocked, those, those hinged and ratcheted instruments. Instruments that were assembled and used for surgery are now going to be disassembled and separated. Sometimes they will be, if they're immersible, they can be soaked in some sterile water, the dirty ones, but the ones that aren't grossly contaminated, we're going to put them nicely back into the tray that they came from and um, get them ready for transport to the decontamination area. The sharps are gonna be placed in a sh the sharps container. And um, typically there is some sort of closed cart system that is used to transport those dirty instruments to the decontamination area. There are a variety of methods that hospitals can use for this. Some of them have elevators and you have a, clo a, a closed cart and you, you push it into the elevator and you hit the button and it goes down to decon and you don't have to do anything else. Some have open carts and that's the same thing. You have to cover them before you take them out. Um, I've worked in really small community hospitals and surgery centers where we kind of shift all of the, the instruments to one side on the back table and we use the back table cover to cover over the instruments and we push them across the hall to decon. Uh, so there's a variety of ways. If they are using a case cart system, there does need to be a biohazard label that is visible. That is a requirement of OSHA. Instrument cleaning and decontamination PPE. So there is a, a series of personal protective equipments. I just laugh because um, just look at this individual. Like there is a whole lot of stuff that he is wearing. Um, the PPE includes protective eyewear. So you can see that he's wearing a shield. He does have a bonnet on and a mask. He also has a face shield. So that face shield um, goes around his head as like a headband and then it comes down uh, over his face. So he's wearing that as well. He also needs to be wearing some sort of full protective bodysuit that is or gown that is impermeable to water. So you can see he has that plasticky looking gown on and then he has some longer gloves that kind of come up over the sleeves. A lot of times these have like those little thumb catches in the sleeve so that it keeps your sleeve down, um, you know, by your wrist and then the glove goes over that. So this is in the decon area. So when the instruments get in the decon area, there is going to be some sorting of sorts. This is an example of what you do not want to do. 
you don't want to send your instruments in a tangled shamble into decon. You also want to think about the heavier instruments versus the delicate instruments. You don't want to put heavy instruments on top of the delicate one. I can remember working at a small hospital and we hired a new tech there. She did a vascular case and they actually took a picture of the tray. It was so awful and in such a tangle and hung it up in the lounge saying, do not do this. Okay, that ruins the instruments and the instruments are really expensive and costly. So um, once again, uh, in decon, they're gonna start sorting things out um, to get them ready for cleaning. If there is equipment or instrumentation that can't be soaked in water, then they're going to separate those out as well. They're gonna separate the heavy from the delicate instruments. They're gonna think about ones that are heat sensitive or can't be immersed, like I said. Um, basins, cups, tubing, suction tips, those kinds of things, they have to be flushed out. So those have to be cared for differently. So they're gonna kind of keep them in their own trays, but they're also gonna think about how those items need to be cared for during the cleaning process, and they're gonna separate them accordingly. Now, when they're doing the cleaning, they're probably gonna start with some sort of hand cleaning. They have these big um, sinks that they fill with water, an enzymatic cleaner, and they will put the instruments into there, especially ortho instruments or any grossly uh, contaminated instruments. They're gonna put them to soak in the enzymatic cleaner uh, for a few minutes, 10 minutes-ish, and um, in some warm water. And then uh, they, they wanna make sure that they don't get it too hot because if the temperatures are hotter than 140 degrees, then that could deactivate the detergent, the enzymatic detergent. So they're gonna have some warm water, they're gonna throw the little things in there to soak, and then they use a variety of brushes uh, to scrub them and to get the gross debris off. If there are instruments that have um, a hollow center, like a straw, we call those cannulated. If there are cannulated instruments, then there's these little wire brushes you see on the bottom left. They're gonna use those to scrub uh, down the center of those instruments and, and push out anything that might be in there. Something else that they might do in addition to the hand cleaning is put them in the ultrasonic washer. The ultrasonic washer, uh, there's an example of it on the top right here, you can see, and uh, this uh, ultrasonic cleaner works by a process called cavitation. And cavitation um, is um, because of the high frequency ultrasonic waves that are used uh, in the cleaning device, these little tiny bubbles are going to be created uh, in and around and on the instruments. And as those little bubbles bust or explode, um, then they're going to push out the debris, okay? Um, so they might go right into the ultrasonic. Um, when I was at the VA here in Phoenix, everything that could um, got hand cleaned if it was uh, grossly contaminated, and then everything went into the ultrasonic, and then after the ultrasonic, we put the instruments into what we call the washer sterilizer. Now the washer sterilizer does not sterilize. Uh, it's like your dishwasher at home, except for it probably gets a little bit hotter. Um, but the washer sterilizer is going to serve as the dishwasher, if you will. Um, and uh, I chose these two pictures, the one in the middle right, um, is on the decon side. So this is on the dirty side, if you will. And that uh, cart gets loaded with the instrument trays and gets pushed into the washer. And then when the washer is done washing, there is um, uh, another side that opens up 
on the, the prep and pack side. So we pull them out the clean side. We push them in the dirty side, they get washed. Somebody, here's the washer alarming on the clean side. They hit the button, they pull it out on the clean side. Okay, so that's how that works. We don't want to take the clean instruments back through decon. We want to have those two uh, separate. Now some instruments require special handling and the eye instruments are a good example. These instruments are very fine and very delicate. They can become damaged easily. Um, most of the time we do use the ultrasonic to clean these guys or they can be hand cleaned. Um, we just want to make sure that we are cleaning them properly because if they are not cleaned properly, then uh, that can result in the next patient getting something called toxic anterior segment syndrome. So there are some guidelines that are suggested um, by Amy. And those suggestions are that as the surge tech during surgery, we want to, and that we have these little square sponges. They're very thin and uh, maybe the size of a post-it note, maybe a little bit bigger, that we moisten and we wipe the instruments off as they come back. Um, at the end of the procedure, they should be immediately submersed in sterile water. And anything that we can use that's a single use, that has that cannula, like um, um, hypodermic needle or uh, something of that sort, um, there's these little um, there's these little needles that we attach to, to some bottles of saline solution that we squirt the eye with. And um, you can see a couple of them in this video here. They have like the little uh, silver hub and it looks like a wire coming off from them. So if we can use disposable cannulas instead, that's the best. Um, any tips or anything that it has a lumen needs to be flushed and brushed. Okay, and then in, in decon, they're going to flush and brush and then they're going to put them in the ultrasonic and they're going to inspect them really closely for any residue before they um, sterilize them. So something we've talked about before and it's rearing its ugly head again is what do we do when we have instruments that could be contaminated with prions? Uh, the word on the street used to be there's no way that we can kill prions. They are protonaceous particles. We cannot denature them because they do not have any nucleic material in them. Um, but now the Society for Healthcare of Epidemiology of America, SHEA, says that uh, there are four ways that you can reprocess these instruments. The first one is to use steam sterilization at 273 degrees for one entire hour. Now, usually we expose it for about four minutes. So four minutes compared to an hour, that's a long cook time, okay? Um, the other thing that we can do is um, a pre-vac at 273 for 18 minutes. Option three is to um, immerse them in a solution of NaOH and water for an hour, then rinse them, then steam sterilize them for an hour, or immerse them in a solution of NaOH for an hour, um, and then cook them for 30 minutes um, at 121 degrees Celsius, and then um, clean them, and then sterilize them again. So, uh, you see how using as much disposable stuff as we could in this situation would be a better option um, as far as keeping our next patient safe um, from prions. Moving on to sorting, inspection, and assemblage. So sorting and inspection. Once the instruments get done in the washer sterilizer that does not sterilize, they will be pulled onto the clean side, the prep and pack side is what I call it. 
and uh, whatever tech um, you know has has a minute or is finished with another tray or project will go and grab a tray as it comes out of the washer sterilizer and um, somewhere in the department is going to be a list that uh, shows all of the instruments that should be in that tray and a lot of times they're housed in the computer and they get printed off um, they could have a computer at their station whatever the case may be um, they're going to start sorting and inspecting those instruments and they're going to make sure that they have all the instruments that they need for that tray. Um, while they are uh, inspecting them, they're going to be looking to make sure that they don't see any visual debris and they're wanting to check to make sure that the instruments are in working order. Okay, so there are some guidelines for assembly and uh, the first uh, and foremost is that as they're loading those ringed instruments on the stringer, they want to make sure they are unlocked. So any hinged instruments need to be open and they're going to be strung together so that they will stay open during the sterilization process. This is important because we want to make sure that the steril sterilant contacts all of the surfaces of the instruments. Sharp and pointed items are going to be pointed downward or they can have little plastic tip protectors that we place over them so that they don't harm anybody on the other side. Uh, instruments need to be disassembled um, for sterilization, so we need to double check that. We want to make sure that the instrument tips are not caught in the little holes, the little mesh holes of the pan, because that could damage the instrument as well. Sometimes we'll put a paper towel uh, or a cloth towel in the bottom of the tray. Uh, some facilities use different things like little foamy mats. Uh, so there's these little um, kind of rubbery mats that can go in the bottom as well, so you might see different things, but we'll lay something in the bottom of the tray to help prevent those instruments from getting caught. We're going to place heavier instruments on the bottom, and we're going to place more delicate ones on the top of the tray if we are, in fact, stacking instruments on top of one another. If there are instruments that are cannulated or have a lumen, like a straw, then we want to pass some sterile water down that lumen so when they go through the steam sterilization process um, they get sterilized inside there properly because if, if air gets trapped in there then um, it's not going to be sterilized. Um, instrument trays should not contain separate items wrapped in peel pouches so we don't want to peel pouch items and place them into the tray with the other stuff to be Sterilized. We don't want to put any elastic bands. We don't want to wrap anything together. Um, and uh, if we have any type of power equipment, then we should make sure that it's tested before we wrap it and it gets processed. If we don't know how a piece of equipment is supposed to be processed, every manufacturer for every piece of equipment that they manufacture that gets sterilized, make something called instructions for use or an IFU. So the instructions for use are a great place to go to get the information about how something should be prepared and then sterile and processed for sterilization. There are a variety of packaging systems, um, and there are some things we want to think about when we're choosing um, a wrapping system. And so one thing we want to think about is, is it going to allow the sterilant to penetrate it and reach all parts inside, but is it also going to let it leave, right? The sterilant needs to be able to penetrate the packaging but it also needs to be able to dissipate out of the packaging. We want to make sure that there isn't any toxic ingredients or dyes, that it doesn't create lint, and that it stands up to the sterilization process that we are putting it through. 
We want to make sure that it protects the equipment until it's time for us to use it, that it's relatively easy for us to work with, and that it allows us to open it on the other side, right? As the surge checks in surgery, we're gonna be opening this stuff that they're packaging. So can we open it in a way that is efficient and leaves the inside goodies sterile, all right? Those are some things that we're thinking about. So similar to drapes, that we talked about before, there are reusable cloth wrappers and there are also non-woven uh, single-use materials. There are peel pouches and there are also rigid sterilization containers. So the top left, you're going to see the cloth uh, wrapper. These woven wrappers um, are dense enough to protect the stuff inside but porous enough to allow the penetration of steam or gas. They have um, a thread count of 140 per square inch. Uh, they have to have that to be effective. And um, sometimes uh, with these single ply materials, we will double wrap whatever uh, thing that we are processing. All right, I don't see these used uh, too much in the United States. Um, we are, um, what I've seen, what I'm more familiar with is the use of these single use non-woven materials. So that's the bottom left. They're the blue wraps that you've been seeing in the lab already as we've started working together. Um, they come in a variety of sizes, so we can get them in 15 inch, 18 inch, 24 inch, uh, two foot by two foot, three foot by three foot, so on and so forth. Peel pouches are something else that we've been using already in the lab and they come in a variety of sizes. They can come self-sealing like the ones you've been using in the lab or they can come in a roll like you see in this image on the top right. And then that is really nice because it allows us to cut it the length that we need it. If we have a real long kind of weird um, item that we're peel pouching, um, but it's not pre-sealed. So there will be a device in the prep and pack area where you can seal each end of the peel pouch. And then you're also familiar now with the closed sterilization containers. They also come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Some have multiple levels. Um, so they, um, they're good because if we're using these blue wraps to wrap instrument trays, they can tear and puncture more easily. So um, it does protect the instruments a bit more. Um, there are two ways that we wrap items. There is an envelope method, which is similar to what you've been using when you open the back table. Or uh, no, um, that is the uh, square fold. So the square, there's, there's the, the envelope and the square fold. So the back table is an example of a square fold whereas the gowns and things that you are wrapping uh, are an example of the envelope fold. There are various methods that facilities use to track the equipment that they use or the instrumentation that they use. It could be something as old and antiquated as a spread, uh, uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, or it could be a very um, up and up system, software system uh, that's used for tracking items. Either way, they're going to track the processing and the use of items. A lot of facilities now also have these vending machines, if you will, and uh, that is depicted on the, in the image on the right here. And uh, they have their disposable supplies that are loaded in there. So if you go to the medical floor or the surgical floor, um, I haven't seen them as much in surgery, 
Um, but uh, definitely on the floors, they have these vending systems and materials manage materials uh, department will stock those but it's basically like a vending machine you have a code or you scan your badge and then you type in your number and whatever you want and it comes out um, this also ties that uh, supply to you as well so that they can know who is using who's overusing um, you get the drift Methods of sterilization that we're going to talk about here in a little bit, so this is just to whet your appetite, we're going to talk about steam sterilization, ethylene oxide sterilization, hydrogen peroxide sterilization, parasitic acid, ozone, um, we're not going to talk too much about dry heat, um, and then ionizing radiation. Um, so these are some various methods we're going to talk about all of them except for the dry heat one. So first, let's talk just a little bit about monitoring. We gave monitoring a shout out a little bit ago. Um, there's various types of monitors and we've touched on some of them before. First and foremost, I wanna talk about the mechanical monitor. So here appearing on your screen, you should see a printout. It looks like a receipt. And this is what uh, the steam sterilizer will print out you can see some things circled, but it's kind of hard to make out the numbers. But when we get something out of the steam sterilizer or any sterilizer for that matter, we want to check the mechanical printout. This is going to tell us, did it reach the temperature it was supposed to reach? We wanted to sterilize it at 270 degrees for four minutes. We want to look and see if it met those parameters. Okay, so that's our first method of checking. Remember when we said one of our principles and practices was, um, you know, using methods that yield measurable results for sterilization. This is one of the ways that we measure um, the results. Okay, so something else we've already talked about and you're seeing these in the lab. These are the chemical indicators or integrators as they are called there are a variety of flavors of chemical indicators there is not a one fits all, uh, one size fits all you can see this one specifically says steam chemical integrator class five it also tells you that the dark bar must pass this point and the dark bar is uh, in that acceptable area. So this is something that we always check with every single item uh, that's, that's steam sterilized should have one of these integrators. Now there's class one, two, three, four, five, and six integrators with this class five being the most common because it reacts to all the critical values over a specified range in the sterilization process. And uh, so this makes it uh, more accurate. So these are used most commonly. If we were um, putting something into the gas sterilizer, uh, the, the ethylene oxide sterilizer, or using some other method, there may be different types of integrators, ones that are specific for EO, ones that might be specific for um, parasitic acid or hydrogen peroxide. So you want to make sure that you get the right chemical integrator. Here is some chemical indicator tape. So this is, both of these are steam sterilization tapes. There is also an indicator tape for the ethylene oxide um, and it is white and when it is processed, the lines look green on there. Okay, so if you're in sterile processing, you wanna make sure that you get the right tape according to what process you're gonna be using, but both of these are steam. Um, you can see the top one is unexposed. That looks like what we're using in the lab. If we were to cook it in the steam sterilizer, it would get these dark lines. And then here's just another color of tape, the bluish green tape, same thing. When those lines go across it, what, that's our visual cue on the outside of the package that it has been sterilized. 
and hopefully it it um, it uh, this is telling us that it it yielded measurable results. Okay. Biological indicators. There, uh, this little guy, remember, is loaded with a live spore. This one for steam sterilization is Geobacillus sterothermophilus. There is a different one for EO, um, but uh, they work in the same way. So this biological indicator um, is going to be placed in every single load that is ran in the steam sterilizer. And then when the load is done, this biological indicator is going to be retrieved. The information, the, the date, the sterilizer, whatever is going to be written on here. The cap is going to get pushed down. That is going to activate the food. If you can see right at the bottom of the purple is little whitish. That is spore food. Okay, so this one and what we call the test, which is one that we just take out of the drawer. It hasn't been cooked, but they're going to become a, a, a pair, all right? And so we're going to push the cap down on the, the test as well, or the control, and both of these are gonna be placed in a special little incubator, and we're gonna let them cook for a while, all right? If it changes color, that means that the spores are alive. So we're going to expect the control or the test to change color. We are going to expect that the one that's been cooked is not going to change color. We're hoping all of those spores are dead on arrival, okay? Uh, so that's a biological indicator. And then the last thing is a monitoring uh, test, a detection test. Um, called the Bowie-Dick test. And uh, DART stands for Daily Air Removal Test. So when we use the steam sterilizer, one of the things that happens is that all of the air gets pushed out of the chamber before the steam comes in. Or, so we want to make sure that it's working properly and it's removing all the air. So that's why it is an air detection test. And uh, this Bowie Dick test is ran in every single sterilizer in the department every day. So typically early in the morning, whoever comes in on first shift is going to run the Bowie Dick test before we cook anything in those sterilizers the steam sterilizers. We want to make sure that they're working properly. We want to put this in a very hard place um, uh, that's furthest away from where the air is getting removed. So bottom front uh, of the sterilizer a lot of times is where we will put this. And um, the, the black card that you see, that means that it was a good test, that all the air was removed. The yellow is before the test. If we were to see a combo of the two, maybe black around the edges and yellow in the middle, that would tell us that something's not going right with the steam sterilizer and we need to have it looked at before we cook anything else in it, okay? All right, so now we're gonna talk about steam sterilization. There's three different types of steam sterilizers that you will come into contact with. Um, the first one is the gravity displacement steam sterilizer. Secondly is the high vacuum sterilizer. And then last is the immediate use steam sterilizer, which we have talked about before. So the big difference between the, steam, the gravity displacement and the high vacuum sterilizer is how air is removed from the chamber. With gravity displacement, the, the, the um, air gets pushed out by gravity, just like, it, just like it implies, gravity displacement, okay? So um, the gravity displacement system injects steam into the chamber and displaces the air. It pushes it down. It's, gravity is causing it to move downward towards the drain, okay? This takes longer. This takes longer, okay, to, to, to do it this way. The high vacuum sterilizer, as it implies, 
has a vacuum that removes the air. There are three distinct phases in every steam sterilizer. And the first one is the conditioning phase, or sometimes called preconditioning. This is when the air is being removed and being replaced by steam. Second is the exposure time, right? We're exposing it, the, the items to the steam sterilization process. The duration depends on the load and the materials that we're sterilizing, which we'll look at here in a second. Uh, and then last is the exhaust. This is the winding down, right? Pressure in the chamber is reduced. The load is going to be exposed to cool air, but don't let that fool you. When it comes out, it is going to be super, super hot. You will need your oven mitts to take that cart out of the steam sterilizer. It's gonna be super hot, okay? Um, Parameters for steam sterilization. Parameters um, include time, temperature, and pressure. And also included in that is the water quality, right? During steam sterilization, um, we want to use water that doesn't have a lot of minerals in it, right? If there are a lot of minerals in the water, then that can stain and corrode the instruments. It can make spots on them. Uh, it can make them more difficult to use. There can become deposits on the surgical instruments that can impair their function and that can be costly for the facility. Also, something that is important is making sure that we load the sterilizer correctly. Now this one image that you see here, this is an example of a large capacity steam sterilizer. They're huge sterilizers that they have in the sterile processing department. But we wanna make sure that we don't overload them, that we um, place linen packs um, on their sides, Packs and instrument trays should be placed so they do not touch. So you don't want to jam pack the cart with instruments because steam needs to be able to circulate all in and around those packages and those trays that you put on there. If we have any basins, let's say, that we, we wrapped or cups or jars or anything like that, we want to place them on their sides because water can collect in them. Okay, so we want to discourage that. Peel packs we want to place on their sides and we don't want to place them paper to paper because they will stick to each other. So there's a plastic side and a paper side. So we want to place them paper to plastic, paper to plastic, paper to plastic. Okay, when the items come out, they need to sit in sterile processing for a while because they're gonna to be too hot to take out into the, to, to the rest of the facility. Um, if you've ever had your sunglasses on and walked outside and it was hot and humid and it was cool inside, you'll immediately get that fogging of your glasses. The same thing happens with these instruments. If they're super hot and they take them to put them on the shelf, then that can cause condensation and we're gonna end up with water or wetness in our trays and that's not good because we know that wetness leads to strike through okay now um if you look on page 197 there's table 10.1 and 10.2 10.1 goes over the parameters for the gravity displacement steam sterilization different exposure times and then how long they have to dry and uh so you can see it addresses uh, exposure times at 250 degrees, 270 degrees, and 275 degrees. So you can look at those at your leisure. Um, the one below that is the dynamic air removal or the prevac steam sterilization. Notice that the, like I said, the gravity displacement takes longer. Um, than the uh, prevac, all right? And prevac does not have a 250 degree Fahrenheit setting. Lastly, the immediate use steam sterilizer. We have talked about that quite a bit before, but we wanna make sure that we are only using it in an emergency situation, that we don't rely on it to sterilize our instruments on a regular basis. 
Um, and that we, we also want to make sure that we're checking all the same things that we would check if we were um, using a standard sterilizer. We do not want to cook implants inside them. Um, the flash sterilizer is not good for sterilizing um, implants. If we are sterilizing items that have a cannula or a lumen, those are going to need to be cooked for a longer time. All right, moving on about uh, talking about the ethylene oxide sterilizer. Remember, ethylene oxide is a gas. It is a very caustic gas. It has been uh, shown to cause cancer in those that are exposed to it over a long period of time. Uh, it is nice because it is a low temperature alternative. So if we have items that cannot be sterilized in high heat with high moisture, then this is a good option. Um, glass and rubber and some powders uh, are, are all sterilized with the ethylene oxide. There is an aeration cycle that is required. Like I said, that gas is very caustic, and so there needs to be time for the gas to dissipate away. Um, facilities that do have these EO sterilizers have to have special alarms. Uh, at the VA, they called them the sniffers, and the sniffers can detect uh, levels, uh, dangerous levels of ethylene oxide, and then they would alarm um, if they did detect that. Uh, I can remember a time at the VA, somebody decided to get the big jug of alcohol and was wiping down all of the tables and the alcohol uh, fumes set off the sniffers. And man, that was, it, it took forever for them to quit alarming. Um, so when we are putting items into the EO sterilizer, we want to make sure that they are dry because if they are not, this could cause a fire. All right. Um, and then let's see, is there anything else that I wanted to say? I think that's it. Another type of sterilization method is vaporized hydrogen peroxide. This is also called gas plasma steril sterilization. A type of gas plasma sterilizer is called the sterad, and that is what you see here. The hydrogen, how it works is the hydrogen peroxide is exposed to a vacuum and that creates, uh, that turns the hydrogen peroxide into a vapor and that vapor is what does the sterilizing. It's a very high, uh, pretty high concentration um, of hydrogen peroxide. And the way, uh, the cycle takes about 30 to 60 minutes and it kills microbes by interfering with the cell membrane, genetic material, and cellular enzymes. Items also need to be clean and dry. We cannot put anything paper into the sterat. So our regular paper pill pouches will not work, neither will our typical uh, integrators. So there's special integrators and special peel packs. They're actually made out of Tyvex. If you've ever heard of Tyvex suits, um, this is the same stuff. So um, Tyvex or Mylar is what is used for the packages and that's also what the integrators are made out of as well. There's four phases uh, for the gas plasma sterilization and the first one is the vacuum phase. That's going to take out all the air. Sound kind of similar to the conditioning phase of the steam sterilizer. Then there's going to be the injection phase where the hydrogen peroxide is injected into the chamber which does sound awfully familiar to the exposure phase of the steam sterilizer. The third phase is the diffusion phase, which is where the um, peroxide is injected in, or I'm sorry, where the hydrogen peroxide vapor disperses uh, throughout the load. And then last is the plasma phase. 
Um, this is where the um, hydrogen peroxide gets broken apart and um, then it is reduced to oxygen and water. So it's safe. There's no harmful products that are left after this gas plasma sterilization. Another type of sterilant is liquid parasitic acid. It used to be very popular back in the day for sterilizing endoscopes, either rigid or flexible ones. It's really great for the flexible ones because you can hook little tubes to the channels of the flexible scopes and it will clean and flush those out as well. Um, this also has a special integrator that goes with it and it has like a little um, cartridge. It kind of looks like if you've used the Keurig, the little little coffee pods, it looks like a gigantic coffee pod um, that um, sits in there and then um, has the sterilants in it and it uh, water mixes with it and that's how it sterilizes the the instrument, the endoscope, like I said, is what we typically sterilize in there. It takes about 45 minutes. Something else about this guy is that um, you can't take out the item and set it on the shelf and store it. So whatever you process in there has to be uh, used immediately. How it kills things is it inactivates cells through oxidation, and it's a good alternative to glutaraldehyde Glutaraldehyde was a common high-level disinfectant that we used to use years ago. Um, it came, uh, uh, we would put it in these big plastic bins and you would soak the stuff in it and, um, or the instruments or whatever, soak them in it. And um, after 20 minutes or so, you would get a high level of disinfection, but if you actually want to use it to sterilize, it takes hours and hours and hours to uh, sterilize with glutaraldehyde, and it is very caustic to the tissue, so it has to be rinsed methodically before it can come into contact with the patient's tissue. So this is a, a much better uh, alternative. Um, but it also needs to be rinsed from the instruments, although it doesn't leave a residue and it does get broken down into vinegar and oxygen when the parasitic acid decomposes. But the this Steris machine does all of that for us. We don't have to remove it from there and rinse it. It does everything for us. Another example of a sterilant is ozone. And ozone uses a molecular form of oxygen, which is three oxygen atoms. And um, this is also used to like filter the air. Uh, a, a while back, these ozone filters were like all the rage for like putting in your house and, you know, filtering the air inside your house. And uh, so it is very safe. It doesn't leave any kind of scary, harmful you know, residue, it doesn't put anything into the bad into the environment. It is also a good alternative to ethylene oxide for those um, pieces of equipment and items that cannot withstand high heat and moisture um, because the ozone is a low heat sterilization process. However, it hasn't been approved for a lot of items. So um, some of the items that it has been approved for is stainless steel, rigid diagnostic instruments like endoscopes and some synthetic uh, substances like those made out of PVC, silicone or PTFE, which we, we do have uh, grafts that we use uh, and uh, meshes and those kinds of things that are made out of those um, synthetic substances. It is not approved for implants and it takes uh, four hours plus for the sterilization cycle. So it's not fast fix if you need something right away. And lastly, bringing up the rear is cobalt 60 radiation. This isn't something that's typically done in house. This is uh, what the manufacturer does. So most of the disposable things that are going to come into the hospital that are prepackaged and sterilized 
are sterilized using this cobalt-60 radiation. It is gamma irradiation. They say that it is safe. Um, it works well for penetrating dense items. So those items that we couldn't sterilize with are other methods that we've talked about. The gamma irradiation is capable of doing that. Um, the sterilization time varies depending on what they're sterilizing and how dense it is. Uh, so I was doing a little bit of research and uh, what I found was it takes hours. So um, it is dependent upon the thing that they're sterilizing. Um, one of the websites that I looked at indicated that the common uses for cobalt-60 radiation are to sterilize various medical devices, pharmaceuticals, um, combination drug and device products, tissue-based and biological products, animal retail products, uh, cosmetics and toiletries, horticultural supplies, and packaging materials. And then I found this interesting image of a layout of a, um, a plant or um, uh, that uses cobalt-60 radiation for sterilization. So you can see where the irradiation room is and the radiation shield, and there's some sort of conveyor system where they load the products onto it and it moves along the conveyor belt um, into the uh, radiation room, that irradiation room. So that was kind of interesting. In regards to sterility, we used to put expiration dates on all things that we processed in-house. That is not typically the case anymore. We have moved to something that makes more sense and is more cost-effective for the facility, and that is called event-related sterility. So that means it is sterile until there is an event that makes it not sterile. So sterility guaranteed unless package is damaged, wet, or open, all right? So um, this, is, um, this is the process that most facilities use. Um, if the wrap is torn or punctured or damaged, or it's been stored in, it, stored in an environment where there aren't any environmental controls, um, or they have found some sort of um, rat or mouse or some sort of other creature living in and around the, the sterilized things, then uh, it's sterile until we open it, okay? That is event-related sterility. So some guidelines for storage. We want to make sure that we're storing sterile items on flat surfaces, that we're not stacking heavy items on top of other items. And here's another thing. We don't store non-sterile items in the same place we store sterile items. We don't want to do that. We also want to try to maintain that in our OR lab at school so that, you know, it's as close to the real world as possible. We don't want to store sterile items near sinks or other areas where they could be exposed to water. For OSHA, we want to make sure that they're not um, too close to the ceiling or too close to the floor. So I think 18 inches is the parameter there, 18 inches away from the ceiling, 18 inches away from the floor. We don't want to um, um, store items um, where we have to handle them excessively. If we have, you know, 10 different types of blades that are in one bin, we're going to have to go digging through them every time to find the one that we need. So we want to store them in open bins that are small and shallow and limit the excessive handling of items. Um, if there are some items that we don't use very frequently, we can put them in dust covers, which are basically these big plastic uh, Ziploc-like baggies. Um, Any time that we take something off from the shelf, we need to check its integrity. And if it has an expiration date, then we need to also check the expiration date before we open it. 
Okay. Um, any items that are commercially prepared and sterilized by manufacturers um, can be considered sterile indefinitely as long as the wrapper is intact. Um, if there is an expiration date printed on the package, then we should um, we should adhere to that. If there isn't one, then we can go by the event related sterility rule. Disinfection. Uh, disinfection uh, means um, that we are going to reduce the microorganisms that are on the surface of something, okay? Um, chemical disinfectants that are used in the healthcare facility um, have four factors that affect their activity. Um, the first one is the concentration of the solution. Every chemical disinfectant has a prescribed dilution, and if we are buying it and it's in a concentrated um, it comes concentrated and we have to dilute it. We want to make sure that we're diluting that exactly as the manufacturer suggests that we should. Um, the bio burden on the object, okay? It's like you went out and played in the mud and then you use some hand sanitizer. If that's the case, that's not going to be effective. The same is true here. So if there's, as the bio burden on the surface increases, the effectiveness of that disinfectant may decrease. The water hardness and the pH can also alter the effectiveness as well as the presence of organic matter on the item. There are three different types, three different levels of disinfectants, high, intermediate, and low, and we're gonna talk about all three of those in a little bit. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention the importance of the material safety data sheets. So uh, they used to be called MSDS sheets. I think now they're called SDS sheets or safety data sheets. Um, they're the same thing, but it's a mandate by OSHA that every single chemical uh, or solution that we have in the department, we have to have uh, an SDS sheet for that. Some safety guidelines for using disinfectants. We wanna make sure we're wearing the right PPE. Okay, we probably don't want to grab a rag uh, with our bare hands and dip it into the disinfecting solutions. We probably wanna wear some gloves to protect our hands. We wanna make sure that it's being stored in a ventilated area. But even though it smells really, uh, really fruity or maybe it doesn't smell bad at all, that doesn't mean that those fumes can't still be toxic to us. Um, we don't ever want to mix two different chemicals together. Um, and then we want to make sure if we are disposing of chemicals that we dispose of them correctly. When we're preparing them, we want to make sure that we measure them precisely and we don't rely on guesswork and that we use a designated measuring device. OK, don't bring your measuring cup from home to use on the chemicals at work and then bring it back and then use it to bake your cake. OK, uh, and then uh, let's see, did I go over everything? Oh, and then lastly, make sure that whatever you're using has a label or if you're the one you know, concocting it, that you make sure that the bottle that you're using has the right label on it already, or that you put a label on it when you um, put it into that container. But don't ever use something that's not labeled, and just hope it is what you think it is. Okay, couple examples of high-level disinfectants. Glutaraldehyde, and Cydex. Cydex um, is the name brand or Cydex OPA for um, a high level disinfectant called orthothalaldehyde. All right, that's short. OPA is short for that. Um, I'm glad because it's hard to say orthothalaldehyde. Um, Glutaraldehyde has kind of fallen to the wayside and has been replaced by Cydex because it is a, 
uh, a safer alternative. Some examples of low level disinfectants are our phenols, uh, which is, phenol is carbolic acid. Remember way back when um, they started washing their hands with carbolic acid. Uh, and then, so that's a low level and it's considered a low level because it does not kill spores. It's not a sporicidal. Uh, phenolics kill um, uh, tuberculosis, they kill fungus, uh, bacteria and viruses, but they don't kill spores. So we wanna make sure that we just use phenols on non-critical items. Quaternary ammonium compounds, also referred to as quats. Quats are fungicidal and bactericidal, but again, they do not kill spores. So we consider it a low level disinfectant. We only use it on non-critical items. Those non-critical items, remember, are items that only come into contact with intact skin. All right, a couple household cleaners, isopropyl alcohol and bleach, all right? Sodium hypochlorite is bleach. Um, so alcohol is a commonly used disinfectant. Again, it is not a sporicidal, but it does greatly reduce the number of um, microorganisms once we get up past about 60 or 70% uh, dilution. OK, um, however, if we are using it like we probably all know right now, using hand sanitizer like it's going out of style, that it does have a tendency to dry our hands. It is also flammable and highly volatile. And so we must make sure that we use it with care and that we never use it around, um, you know, pottery or any type of fire or where there could be a spark or anything like that. And then uh, the hypochlorite. Uh, or sodium hypochlorite is what bleach is, um, is also used for environmental cleaning. Um, it's, a, in, it's effective and it is inexpensive. Um, however, it can um, damage the respiratory tract if it's not diluted properly. So we're coming into the home stretch here, talking about routine decontamination of the surgical suite. Before we begin our first case of the day, we are going to do some cleaning. We are going to um, grab some exam gloves and a rag and probably some spray or whatever type of disinfectant um, the facility has, and we're going to wipe down all of our flat surfaces. We're going to stop it, start in the middle at the top of the room with the OR lights, and we're going to wipe the OR lights. We're going to wipe the OR table, at the top of it, the base of it, and then we're going to work our way outwards, wiping our back tables, our mayo stands, the countertops, any flat surfaces that we encounter from top middle, down, and out to the periphery, okay? That's before we begin the work day. During surgery, our role is to try to maintain as clean environment as we can, and the circulator is gonna help us with that. They're gonna be bagging trash and, and tying up the trash bags that are full and putting them in the corner and putting a new trash bag. Um, we're gonna make sure that we handle our sharps safely and use the best practices as possible. Um, any blood or fluid or anything that gets spilled on the floor, um, the nurse is going to um, try to contain that spill um, in whichever way that she can, whether it's um, just by wiping it up with a towel and putting it in the, the you know, in the linen or um, getting some sort of suction device if there's a lot of fluid there. If we have a tissue specimen or blood or other body fluids, we wanna make sure that we put them in a leak proof container to transport them out of the department. Um, paper products. Um, every effort should be made to keep patients' charts, lab slips, radiograph reports, 
and any paper documentation free of contamination. We don't want it to be splattered with blood when it goes up, you know, to the floor or whatever the case may be. Any contaminated sponges that we have, those go in the kick bucket. It's that little bucket with wheels that you see in the laboratory. That's only for sponges. It's not a trash can, all right? And we're also going to make sure that we put any grossly contaminated sponges or, or anything like that into the red biohazard bags and then the regular trash bags. We call that our clean trash. If we have instruments that fall off the field, the circulator is going to put on a pair of gloves and pick up that instrument for us and probably set it under our table, set it to the side, um, maybe um, spray it with some disinfectant and put it under our table. If we need another one, then they would retrieve that for us. Now, after surgery, after surgery, we are going to take our stuff to decon and then we're gonna come back and help do what we call the turnover. And the turnover is, it is something that the facility really focuses on, the turnover time, how long it takes from when this patient leaves the operating room until this patient comes into the operating room. That span of time is called the turnover time and facilities are really persnickety about long turnover times. They wanna go, 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 chop, 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 right? So, uh, you know, they're gonna, people are gonna descend on the room like a bunch of locusts and be buzzing around and cleaning it up after surgery. So the floors are gonna be mopped. And one thing about mopping the, the floor is that we don't wanna double dip our mop, right? We're going to have mops that have replaceable mop heads and we're gonna, dip our mop and we're gonna mop and then we're gonna dispose of it in the, in the linen bag, wherever that designated linen bag is, not in the room, but outside of the room. And if the, the floor is really soiled and we need another mop, we're going to change the mop head. It's not like at home where, you know, you mop the kitchen and then you dip back in the bucket, you mop the dining room and you dip back in the bucket. We don't do that, and, and maybe you don't do that at home either, um, but we don't double dip the mop. Um, we're gonna take the pads off from the operating room table. We're gonna wipe everything down. We're gonna wipe the mayo stand all the way down from the top all the way to the bottom. The back table um, it usually has two shelves down the legs. Everything is gonna get wiped down really well. The operating table is gonna be moved to the side so that we can mop underneath that um, any equipment that's in there is going to get wiped down as well. If there's um, one of those fancy suctions, you might have to take it and dock it somewhere so that the, the suction machine does its cleaning thing before you bring it back. Um, if there is schmutz on the walls or ceiling or, or lights, OR lights, those are all going to be spot cleaned. We're not going to wipe all the walls and uh, the entire ceiling between every single case. We're not gonna do that. We're just gonna spot clean them between cases. Um, then after, like we're gonna bag the trash, we're gonna bag the linen, all of that's gonna be taken out. Um, these disinfectants have a contact time. So we need to make sure that um, if it says it needs to stay on for five minutes to do its job, then it needs to stay on for five minutes to do its job. At the surgery center that I worked at, they were so focused on the turnover time that um, we, we were getting into the habit of having one wet rag and one dry rag. And we wipe down the OR table with the wet rag and we come right after it and wipe it down with the dry rag because we got to hurry. So um, that was brought to materials attention and materials got us a different type of disinfectant that had a shorter contact time, okay? So be cognizant of that, all right? Um, so after everything is cleaned, then, you know, everything needs to be replaced. So we're gonna put new bags in the trash. We're going to make the bed with new fresh linen. Um, and then we're gonna get ready to bring in the stuff for our next case. And then it just starts all over again. Lastly, uh, last thing I want to talk about is terminal cleaning. 
So terminal cleaning, um, the book says takes place at the close of each workday. That has not been my experience. Um, typically, uh, there's a, a weekly terminal cleaning schedule. I don't know now if some facilities are doing a terminal clean every day at the end of the day. Um, but like I said, the terminal cleaning is going to take place on a scheduled basis but not in between cases, either the end of the day or once a week or whatever the case may be. And this is gonna be a more deeper clean. This is kind of more like your spring cleaning that you do in your house. So the operating room table is all gonna be taken apart. The positioning equipment is all gonna be taken apart. Everything's gonna be wiped down. Um, all the furniture, including tables, prep stands, chairs, tools, desks, lights, um, they used to even have us come in and like clean the wheels of things um, when we were doing a really deep clean. Um, they'll probably wet mop, the, the um, dust mop the walls and the ceilings, um, all of that stuff. So it's going to be a more um, detailed and deeper clean than just the typical procedure after surgery or what I refer to as the turnover. Okay, so that concludes our lecture on decontamination, sterilization, and disinfection. I'm so happy that my voice held out. I hope that you held out, um, that it was helpful to your learning, and that I could demystify some of the contents of this chapter. If there is anything that still is a little fuzzy or doesn't make sense, make sure you write that down as a muddy point and then post it in your discussion. So for chapter 10, you'll be doing pretty much the same thing you did for chapter nine. You'll be identifying your muddy points and posting those. You'll also be working on your case study as a group. The case study is on page 205 and it has five different parts. So Google Doc will be good for that. Do your case study post your individual muddy points and I look forward to reading those and addressing those when we speak again in our synchronous lecture um, on Monday. Okay, until then, take care.